Hello and welcome back to the ROI channel, the channel that's obsessed with the art and science of return on investment. I uh, had a very busy couple of weeks, guys, uh, all for good reasons. I'm very excited. Uh, today, we're going to be doing a stock analysis. It is a position that's in the publicly accessible uh, eToro portfolio. And I'm going to be talking uh, about a few other things, which I'll mention as we go. Hope you like the new 4K uh, version of me. Uh, I'm building out a new library studio sanctuary. Uh, <laughs> and so that's taking a, uh, taking a bit of time. It's a bit of a mess, as you can probably see in the background. But I have also uh, upgraded a hell of a lot of equipment. And so I will be working out over the weekend somehow um, how to connect my new road uh, mic and sound system and all that sort of stuff, guys. So got a lot happening, really excited, and there's a hell of a lot happening in the market. So let's get into it. Today, we're talking about flow traders. I'm going to go over the company, going to give a valuation qualitatively and quantitatively what I think of the business and uh, my verdict. Do I think it's investment grade uh, and the various reasons for my thesis? Let's get straight into it. If you haven't already liked and subscribed to the channel, I'd greatly appreciate you doing so. And if you're interested in a value fund, by all means, do add us to the watch list. Crassus Investments on eToro, the link will be in the description. So here's a, a new format. So I'm just going to give you a one page overview uh, as of August in 2022. So the revenue 2022 is expected to be around 393 million. It's KGAR at about 6% and expected to do 6% into the future. Uh, same deal with EBITDA, depending on you know, various analysis that you look at. EBITDA expected to come in just shy at 150 million. Free cash flow, that's really what I like to look at most uh, as a cash flow investor. And we're coming into an environment where people are really learning the hard way when they've ignored or uh, downplayed free cash flow as an important uh, metric in their investment process. And we've seen, you know, multiples of revenue being paid and all this, uh, all this kind of rubbish. So let's have a look. Enterprise value is basically the same as their market cap, okay? Their net debt positions, uh, you know, more or less zero as of their quarterly reporting. $873. Uh, I'm putting dollar signs in uh, because the euro and the dollar, uh, as we know, are basically at parity at the moment. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see what happens with the euro. I think it's a, it's a, well, it's a disaster. In any case, please understand uh, these guys trade on the Amsterdam exchange. And so I really should have used the E symbol, but the, the dollar was in my, my format. But at the moment, it, it still works out uh, quite well. All the valuation metrics have been done in euro, even if I've put the dollar sign on there. So I hope that doesn't confuse you. Enterprise value to free cash flow. If you don't know what that is, it's the enterprise value, which is the market cap plus the debt minus the cash. Okay, so the number of shares outstanding times by the current share price plus the debt minus the cash. It's a way of accounting for the debt uh, when you buy in the business. So we're looking at the free cash flow versus the company, not just the share price, but also the debt that it holds. So if, in our case here, it doesn't really matter because the net debt is zero, but in highly levered companies, which uh, we're starting to look at even more in the commodities space because my theses uh, are all playing out and I want to get the most leverage to the upside that I can, it is important. Historical mean multiple uh, using market cap to free cash flow of 11 times. So what does that mean? It means normally you would expect, um, or normally uh, over history, people have been willing to pay 11 times the free cash flow. And we've got an EV to free cash flow yield of about 15%. So normally we'd expect that yield to contract to about eight, eight and a half percent, maybe a little bit more than that, which means people historically have been willing to pay more as a multiple for every dollar of cash flow that this particular company uh, Produces, And I think that 11 times uh, for this type of company is really quite reasonable for reasons which I'll go into. Return on equity over the last six years has been 40%. Now, this is a business that, um, that has very little leverage, okay? Sometimes when you look at a business, the return on equity looks outstanding and you find out that instead of raising equity, they've just geared it to the eyeballs with debt. That's not the case with this company. They have been able to take shareholders' funds and deploy those funds at a, a return on equity of 40%. Very, very, very impressive. Over the long, over the long term, uh, assuming your multiples stay the same and the business is a, a fairly predictable business, uh, as Charlie Munger would say, your expected return on investment will 
look very similar to your return on invested capital and depending on the capital structure of the business. This business doesn't have a lot of debt and so return on equity is a really good metric to use. Uh, buybacks last year about 1.2% of the float and so that's a sign of a management that is uh, they're, they're in a growth stage at the moment but they're certainly willing to dish out dividends and uh, to buy back this stock so they, they do care about creating value for shareholders which is exactly what we want all right let's move things around flow w what do they do what's this business I'm, I'm really working hard at the moment to be very precise and be very concise with my language um, in in all the languages that I speak and write. So I'm working hard on my writing ability and hopefully that transfer, uh, transforms over to uh, the presentation. As a liquidity provider, we help maintain and improve the overall transparency and efficiency of the ecosystem by quoting bid ask spreads for financial products. Then, and this is taken from the company, by providing liquidity, we make it easier for investors to buy and sell financial products at a price that should reflect the current price of the underlying asset, contributing to lower trading costs. So I've given my translation of that down the bottom. In other words, they're market makers. So these guys look out and they find uh, a seller, they find a buyer, they match those up and they take a commission. Very much like eToro does, okay? They're, they're a brokerage um, platform. Um, with very interesting trading algorithms and ideas. They're very quantitative based. Let's have a look at market makers as a business model. I'm gonna briefly pause here to talk about something extremely important as we move into a stagflationary environment. And that is, we are looking for businesses that are asset light, that have high margins and can maintain those margins over time. We're looking for royalty type plays. What I, what I call them is a clip the ticket type business model. And so we're gonna see why that's important. Uh, I've spent all weekend reading Go Rosen's quarterly report and Horizon Kinetics. And so I'll do a separate video, perhaps if you guys like um, giving my thoughts and how that applies moving forwards. But that's what I'm looking for. Asset light royalty clip the ticket style businesses outside of energy producers basically. So here's what they do. They've got a seller, they've got a buyer, these guys electronically, of course, it's not like the old days when you're in a souk or, uh, or the New York Stock Exchange, but the same principles apply. They make the market and they take a small commission. And this is a really beautiful, beautiful business model. Why? Because when the market is up, lots of people are buying in, lots of transaction volumes at higher prices increases their fees and when the market sells off every transaction transaction volume increases because um, there's forced liquidity from sellers having to sell and they're getting a clip of all those different transactions okay beautiful style business very um, uh, royalty type in a in a way that they take a clip of every transaction asset light they don't need a lot to run this business they don't need an awful amount of employees they have invested a lot more into uh, opening up various markets for which they can make markets and i think that they'll become highly dominant in, pl in places around the crypto space again it doesn't matter that uh, crypto might be worthless and people lose money on crypto. These guys don't own it. They're simply the casino that takes a clip of every transaction. It's a casino model, guys. So you got your punters at the blackjack table. They may win, they may lose on the night. It doesn't matter. The casino is always taking a clip every time they lose. They're taking a clip when they buy. Well, usually you don't buy a drink. You have drinks brought to you at the bar, but you understand what I'm saying. Um, you got cover charge at the nightclubs at the, you know in Vegas uh, and all these different places. It's been a while since I've been to Vegas. I need to get back. But that's the type of uh, model that we're talking about. They don't require a large amount of employees because they're highly AI and quantitative driven. So here I've broken it down a little further with a few numbers. So you got a, a guy who's bidding $99 for an asset and a seller that's um, asking 101. They go to the market maker. He splits the difference and you know, there, there'll be a slippage and they'll, they'll keep it. Similar to eToro, um, eToro, if you say you're going to sell something for uh, $100, they find a buyer who's willing to, to pay $100.02. The, the market meets, they get matched, and eToro pockets a $0.02 cent, uh, spread. Okay, so very, very similar stuff. Uh, these guys operate in, in, globe, uh, in broader markets. 
why is this model so attractive? So this is uh, particular to this business, but it's generally applicable to the businesses that uh, I'm positioned, have been positioned and, and I'm looking to position um, with more haste, um, realizing how fast we're moving into a stagflationary environment. Characteristics of a business that are anti-fragile to stagflation. Uh, as a recap, anti-fragile means they grow disproportionately from volatility. So it's not just that they survive shocks, that they survive shocks and actually improve or get stronger. So we're looking for asset light, royalty type revenue, where as Rick Rule would say, your gross is your net. So royalty and streaming business on the mining, doesn't matter what happens to the price of gold necessarily, up, down, sideways, their margins don't get squeezed, the diesel costs increase, and it, all of a sudden it's costing you way more to dig the gold out of the ground and transport it so that the producer's margins are getting squeezed. These guys simply take a clip of the revenue, pay their employees, which are relatively small, and effectively their gross is their net. Their revenue is almost the same as their net income. Their expense, um, the expense portion of their income statement is very, very small. And I like to call it clip the ticket model, as you know. They've got high margins and they'll benefit from both the increased volume and increased nominal pricing, very important. So as inflation starts to rise the nominal cost of goods and services, I just went to the supermarket um, the other day. I don't usually go, um, luckily my girlfriend does all the shopping for, for us, but just basic stuff. Like I buy a lot of you know, healthcare stuff and the costs of things like chewing gum, even I notice has just gone through the roof. So that's important because nominal pricing of everything is going up. And if you're the broker, if you're the, uh, the ticket clipper, not only are you getting increased volume, you're getting increased prices. Guess what? That's increased fees for you, or in this case for, for flow traders and their investors. So the investment thesis, we're looking for a quality business operation, which I believe this is for reasons that I just mentioned. They're a natural volatility and inflation hedge. So we, we will have some really sharp pullbacks, uh, which we've seen in the, uh, the energy space. These guys will benefit from volatility and due to their ability to, or the nature of their business uh, to take commissions uh, from selling transactions as well as buying transactions. Bull market, bear market, these guys like it. They don't like a flat market because they don't clip as many tickets if you want to look at it that way. Huge growth prospects with what the company is doing moving into other asset classes. Another very key thing, and I'd encourage everyone to read Horizon Kinetics research from uh, this second quarter just gone, talking about the death of indexing and how indexing has become so grossly popular that we, you know, you've got five companies making up a, a tremendous amount of the index and that now defeats the purpose because the whole idea of indexing was for diversification but today if you buy an SP, the SPY ETF you're not diversified you're buying five companies and the environment in which we're moving into is not necessarily the environment in which the likes of your, your Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google, and so forth will continue to thrive the same way that they have. I don't think that they're going out of business anytime soon, but you've got this unraveling of people that will need more disposable income and they've invested in these index funds and these ETFs. Think about it. If you're an ETF, you got to buy all these different uh, holdings. How do you liquidate when you get redemptions? And so this is where uh, players like uh, Flow come in because they'll provide that liquidity. They'll buy some of these shares and then help with the dispersion of selling them on, making that market. That's going to be, that's something that I don't think anyone is talking about. And it's extremely, uh, extremely pertinent and important to us moving forward. And they've got diversified revenue streams, all the different asset classes. If one comes into vogue, if it's publicly traded, if it's listed, and these guys operate in those markets, they'll be taking a clip, providing liquidity as the market maker. So again, taken from the, uh, the website, let me move that over here somewhere. Medium-term growth focus, enlarging their global exchange traded product uh, the footprint. So they're moving into global markets. They're the market leader in the US and they're looking to crack the, uh, in the, in Europe, excuse me. And they're looking to crack the US. That would be huge for them. Enhanced coverage of fixed income. So we have more and more fixed income coming in. Pension funds need um, 
to be able to invest in that for liquidity purposes. And these guys obviously um, play a huge role in providing liquidity. If they can be, uh, and their goal is to be in the top three liquidity providers for fixed income, they will be making a hell of a lot of money from those fees. Moving into currencies and cryptos. Now, when you're in an inflationary environment, okay, Project Zimbabwe, as our friend Cuppy uh, talks about, being able to move currency to, to get out of weaker currencies into stronger currencies is huge. So again, there's, there's a really growth market under all of these um, particular niches into which they're looking to move. So uh, I'm quite excited with their ability to, uh, with, with the direction in which the company is heading. Here's a little overview, never sure where to, to move the camera. These are some assumptions for a, a five-year DCF that I have uh, given. Now up here, you've got out in the eToro portfolio, average entry price is 21.33. Again, it is Euro guys, I'm just using parity because the my template has a dollar sign, but Euro, Euro, Euro. These are the assumptions. Obviously you guys can put in your own assumption. I have used a, a multiple below the historic mean. Okay, so very uh, conservative as always. I've not given them any credit for share, di uh, for share dilution nor buybacks into the future. I'm just assuming that they'll remain static. The cash is uh, at the moment, um, cash equals their debt more or less. Very, very light business. Look, they can generate without uh, generate uh, revenues and free cash flow without um, commensurate increases in CapEx. Really, really important uh, point moving forwards. So anything here really to point out, I've given them a very slow, um, like 8% growth rate. And I think that they'll be able to do a lot better than that on their, on their EBIT. The cash flows will be lumpy. So in a year like 2020, they'll be huge. They'll be through the moon. And you'll see that in the, the price chart that I'll show in a moment. And then in quieter uh, years and months when things are a little bit easier, there's less volume and they'll have quieter years in terms of their commission fees. All that being said and done, here uh, with our entry price, and uh, this is a base case, model suggesting an IRR of 24%, which is very, very good considering the conservative nature of the assumptions and the quality of the underlying business. If you're looking at current price, uh, about 20 euro, obviously you've got more upside at 26%. Discount rate is a working average. Uh, it's a weighted average cost of capital. Okay. So you guys know how I roll with that type of thing. Then I like to move into uh, a few different scenarios into the future. The future is inherently unknowable. So I put a few different um, simple theses together and apply probabilities to each. So the base case, the bull case, and the bear case. You guys can go through and look at that at your own time if you wish very conservative growth rates and very conservative multiples, okay? And I've done this for a reason. I wanna show you guys, if we're being super greedy and asking for 30% yields, can we, still make, can we still make the investment case work? And the answer is yes, we can. With negative growth in the bear case and a 50% yield, which would you know, be a, a blowout or, or a, a collapse in multiple, blowout in yields, collapse in multiple, their inverse relationships. Uh, looking at these uh, different scenarios, that suggests you're looking at a, a, an intrinsic value of $26, uh, 26 euro and 73 cents. Two thirds to that would be 17.64. But as again, I wish to really stress, I've used ridiculously low uh, multiples. And I think that if you, you put it closer, to um, fair value in terms of the multiple, not necessarily the historic mean, but um, if you were to put, let's say a, a 12 and a half yield, so an eight, an eight multiple in the base case, I think that that's quite reasonable. You're gonna see that the valuations uh, skyrocket. So you can play around with that. Uh, if you're interested in me coming up with a newsletter style um, business, uh, drop a comment in there and I'll, uh, have a look at getting an outsourced team together and I'll come up with some research analyses and they'll put it together in a nice, um, beautiful looking way that you can look at research and, and what I'm thinking with my recommendations and they can, it'll just be in, um, in further, further depth. So if you're interested in that, let me know um, and I'll, I'll see what we can do in terms of coming up with a low cost 
um, subscription-y model business, a Substack type deal. Float traders, here's a chart last year. And so you can see subject to some volatile swings based on sentiment, based on market, based on their ability to um, collect fees. What you'll see recently is that they changed their payout ratio. They reduced it. Instead of paying out more in dividends, they're using more of their free cash flow for growth. And the market is just not liking anyone that's discounting future cash flows at the moment. Everyone wants their cash back, given back to them at the moment. Anyone who's reinvesting is being punished in terms of multiples by the market. Doesn't make any sense in the case of flow traders because of that high return on equity. So if you've got a business that can generate 40% return on equity, really wouldn't we rather that they have the money and continue to compound it? Whereas if we get that given back to us, we've got to then decide, we've got to come up with other opportunity costs, okay? So in this case, um, I think that it's a mistake by the market and I'm looking to capitalize. Here we go. All righty. So I've drawn a few little lines here just to show some things that I thought were, were interesting. So here's COVID, boom, everything gets whacked, March 2020. Then we've got capitulation selling. We've got um, all this panic in the market and people realize, well, hang on a minute. These guys are going to make a lot of money from uh, clipping the ticket, getting the commission fees. And we had liquidity um you know, bank reserves being printed, people being given out loans directly, throwing it into the stock market, commission, 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 commission for these guys. And so they went on an absolute tear. They were up 100% in just a couple of months. Violent retracement, as you can see, violent upswing again. And then we're, we're getting pretty close to the 50% retracement. And so it'd be really, really interesting if they could be, um, if there could be another huge, 100% plus upside um, based on history. Interesting to, to point that out. So the verdict for me, as you may have uh, realized by now, long, okay, so I'm going long the stock uh, personally and I've uh, got some auction, options in um, my arbitrage book that I run. Three to 5% uh, of assets under management, okay? Revenue, EBIT and free cash flow growth is there. It'll act as a natural hedge, cyclical in nature. So there'll be ups and downs. And so look, if you guys, it's a price we pay for our performance is the volatility. We see things going up and down all the time, mightn't feel great, but that's the, the nature of the beast. We've got to capitalize where we are now on a huge drawdown for a quality business that fits every criteria that I have decided is important to me over the next decade into a, an inflationary, stagflationary environment. You can't afford to dilly dally. If it goes down 10% or 20% more, so be it. I'm happy with the valuation. And so I've entered the market. It's anti fragile, it likes the volatility, and it fits my, my favorite uh, clip the ticket business model. There we are, guys. I hope that you enjoyed that. If you did, please like, uh, subscribe, and comment on the YouTube channel. If you're interested in me coming up with a Substack, put a comment in there uh, and talk about what you may wish to see on there. And so anyone else interested in uh, checking out the portfolio, uh, there's a link in the description. You can download eToro and add some funds and copy the portfolio, or you can simply add us to a watch list. Thank you very much for watching. Disclaimer, as always, not a financial advisor, thank goodness. And I don't know your particular circumstance. Nothing that I say here is intended to be, nor does it constitute advice. It's my opinion. It's what I'm doing with my money and the money that I look after doesn't mean that it's right. It doesn't mean that it's right for you. So please take that seriously, guys, and ensure that you take responsibility for your financial decisions and their associated consequences. Having said that, I hope that you enjoyed it and I look forward to hearing from you in the comments section.